To understand the Second Amendment to the Constitution, we should start with the words of the amendment itself. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It's just one simple, short sentence. But over the last 30 years, it has become the subject of passionate advocacy and intense political controversy. Throughout that time, we have debated the Second Amendment. To those who are opposed to more gun control, every restriction of their rights is a violation of the Second Amendment. To those who support more gun control, none of the proposals or restrictions ever violate the Second Amendment. As a lawyer, I understand and appreciate the need for clarity in the law. If we expect citizens to comply with the law, we must be clear about their legal rights and responsibilities. Unfortunately, in the case of the Second Amendment, it's become shrouded in controversy and distortion. If we are ever going to reduce the level of gun violence in this country, this distortion must first end. So, how did we get here? And what is the meaning of the Second Amendment? First, a bit of history. As the name implies, it was part of the first ten amendments, sometimes referred to as our Bill of Rights. Those other nine amendments, however, have never been the subject of the intense scrutiny and controversy about their basic purpose and meaning, as has the Second Amendment. What did our founding fathers really mean when they referred to the need for a well-regulated militia? And what is a militia anyway? Is it that states were allowed to have their own armies without interference from the federal government? Or is it that citizens were allowed to have guns without interference from either the state or the federal government? This controversy about the Second Amendment is a recent phenomenon. For the first 200 years, it was a sleepy provision that was only interest to a few legal historians. In my law school class in 1976 on constitutional law, the Second Amendment was just a footnote in the textbook, and as best I can remember, we never discussed it in the classroom. You see, there were hardly any cases decided in the 19th or 20th century about the Second Amendment, and those few that were gave it a very narrow interpretation. For example, in 1939, when organized crime was a serious problem, the Supreme Court ruled that a federal prohibition on the interstate transportation of sawed-off shotguns did not violate the Second Amendment. The court explained that the Second Amendment was designed to protect state militia. And as state militia were out of vogue in the 20th century, the continued relevance of the Second Amendment became highly questionable. But all this changed late in the 20th century, starting with the assassination of Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy and the resulting passage of the Gun Control Act of 1968, gun violence and restrictions on guns became a hot political issue. The issue continued as more and more violence occurred. We came as a nation struggled with such high-profile tragedies as the shooting of 15 students and teachers at Columbine High School in 1999. Now, at about the same time that this was occurring, a little-known organization, the National Rifle Association, was transforming itself 
from a sleepy nonprofit charity into a political powerhouse advocating for the rights of gun owners. For the first hundred years of the NRA, it was focused almost exclusively on marksmanship, awarding ribbons and prizes to young men learning to shoot firearms, including one I received at a summer camp in the 1960s. When this transformation was complete, the NRA came to the position that the Second Amendment guaranteed the absolute right of every American citizen to have a gun. This became the cornerstone over the last 30 years of the NRA's advocacy and fundraising. At one point, the president of the NRA, Charlton Heston, in a speech before the National Press Club, laid down the NRA's position on the Second Amendment in no uncertain terms. I simply cannot stand and watch a right guaranteed by the Constitution of the United States come apart under attack from those who either can't understand it, don't like the sound of it, or find themselves too philosophically squeamish to see why it remains the first among equals, because it is the right we turn to when all else fails. The problem with this is that there was no support in the law from lawyers, from judges, from legal scholars for this new position the NRA took. The NRA had come up with this position all by itself without any basis in the law. At one point, the former Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, the highest court in the land, the Chief Justice, characterized the NRA's position as follows. One of the greatest pieces of fraud, I repeat the word fraud, on the American public that I have witnessed in my lifetime. This would be enough to end the story here, but we're far from the end. The NRA continued to advance its extreme position of the Second Amendment without any support. The issues of gun violence and gun control became more and more heated. And there were more cases filed under the Second Amendment seeking to overturn those few laws on the books that did restrict gun rights. Initially, those cases were unsuccessful. But eventually, in 2007, they struck gold when the United States Supreme Court, in a five to four decision entitled District of Columbia versus Heller, struck down a DC law that prohibited the ownership of handguns within the District of Columbia. The five member majority threw out 200 years of legal precedent and ruled for the first time in our history that the Second Amendment is an individual right, not a right to protect outdated state militia. Initially, this looked like a big win for the NRA. This would open the floodgates to many more successful Second Amendment challenges. But surprisingly, that flood never came. Oh, there were cases filed under the Second Amendment after the Supreme Court's Heller decision, but almost none of them succeeded. You see, the Supreme Court in Heller explained that that Second Amendment, although an individual right, like other individual rights in the Constitution, was subject to limits, and the limitations on the Second Amendment were significant. Essentially what the court said is that under the Second Amendment, only law-abiding adults, not criminals, not minors, not the mentally ill, have a right to a gun, not any gun of their choice, to be kept in the home, not at work, not at school, and not in the car, for the self-defense of those in the home, not for hunting, not for target shooting, and certainly not for private vigilantes. 
So with these restrictions, we are now realizing that the proposals that have been debated in Congress and state legislatures over the last few decades do not violate the new Second Amendment. These are not violations of the court's new Heller-era interpretation of the Second Amendment. It's almost as if the judiciary hit the pause button on the Heller decision and have not used Heller to strike down any of the gun laws that are designed to keep us safe in our homes and our communities. Here in Maine, a disabled veteran claimed that he had a Second Amendment right to keep a gun in his Rockland apartment in order to stop criminals from breaking into his apartment and stealing his medication while he watched helplessly. When it became known that the tenant had a gun, the landlord went to court to evict the tenant for violating the no gun clause in the tenant's lease. Despite these sympathetic facts, the Maine Superior Court, in a controversial case in which I participated in the side of the landlord, ruled that tenants do not have a Second Amendment constitutional right to have guns in their apartment. So if a landlord wants to have a gun-free apartment building, tenants with guns will have to leave them with a friend or find someplace else to live. It is my hope that when the limitations on the Second Amendment are understood, the Second Amendment will no longer be an impediment to the passage of reasonable and common sense gun laws. And when that occurs, the people of the United States, through their elected representatives, will be able to join the rest of the civilized world where guns are carefully and thoughtfully regulated in order to keep us safe from gun violence. Thank you.